Thank you very much, Senator Tester. Senator Vance, the floor is yours for questions. Great. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I agree, uh, Senator Tester. And, and my questions are going to pick up uh, largely in the same vein. Um, Mr. Burke, you, I, the, the thing that I struggle with in sort of reviewing materials that my staff prepared for me uh, for, for this hearing and just obviously experiencing this particular problem as a, as a human being, I mean, I, you know, my, my own mom just a, just a couple of weeks ago sort of called me and gave me uh, the, the, the quick hits of a particular scam that, that, had, been, that had been targeted at her. And it, it seems like we keep on tinkering around the edges here a little bit. We sort of do these little things and maybe they slow it down to Senator Tester's point. Uh, but we're, we're fundamentally allowing crooks to prey on some of the most vulnerable people in our country, uh, people who are living on fixed incomes and so forth. And I, I guess I'm just wondering... If we were willing to do something big, and I, I, this is one of the few things maybe that you could get bipartisan majorities in this house uh, or this chamber to do, if we were to do something like really big here, wh what could actually stop this, right? So the example that we talked about, uh, or that I, I was talking about earlier, uh, just with a friend, is you know you, you you ban robocallers from calling a particular number. But then let's say an individual goes and signs up on something online and they don't read the 75 pages of fine print. And one of those pages of fine print effectively signs their number up to be robocalled. And that opens up the floodgates that allows criminals to go after them. I, I'm just wondering, like, what can we actually do to stop this thing? I'm going to pick up where Senator Tester left off. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, I think one of the challenges here is the phone system by its nature is a series of interconnected networks. So the providers that are support providing service to us, all they know is like your mailman would know, what's, what's the address, where's this going? They don't know what's inside the content. So that's the fundamental challenge. And what we do in Traceback, we trace back the illegal calls and we yep. hit five, six, seven, eight providers that all touch it away and it mixes in with legal traffic as well. So I think that's where I think what is big is criminal enforcement. It's, it's the theme that I'm going to keep hit, hitting here because if even if we stopped every single robocall, the, the criminals who do this, their day job is still defrauding Americans and they'll just find a new version. So the only way to get them to stop defrauding Americans is criminal enforcement. Do, do we have a sense of how many of these people are actually in America versus how, how many of them are, are overseas? So, so in our experience, it, it varies a little bit based on the type of call. So the pure fraud robocalls, the pure fraud phishing calls, voice phishing calls, et cetera, those are predominantly coming from overseas. The uh, unsolicited telemarketing calls, those may originate here and be done um, by people here. But to what Megan said before, um, we, one of the reasons it's hard to collect fines against them is they pop up a new shell company, d dissolve the old one, and are now doing new robocalls under a new name. And, I do think there's some laws that might apply and that might make that criminal as well. And wh where are they coming from, the ones overseas? I mean, are they particular areas? You know, you sort of hear about Eastern Europe or Nigeria. Sort of, wh where are these things actually coming from? A lot are from India. Some are from Dominican Republic, um, some other countries as well. But India is a, a big portion of the cost. And, and has there been any effort sort of diplomatically, uh, legally, to interface with some of the countries where this fraud is most common and actually use the extraordinary leverage the United States has uh, to bring some of these folks to justice? Or is, is there sort of an attitude, like once it's in another country, it's such small ball things relative to other international crime, we don't focus on it, but of course, it's not small ball to the people who are affected by it. There has been collaboration, and, and when there's collaboration, when our FBI works with the Central Bureau of Intelligence in India and, and raids these call centers, we see the impact. Umail data will show just government imposter scans dropped immediately after those raids. So I think that's a testament to why we should keep prioritizing that, because it does work. Okay. Uh, one, one final question here. We're actually going to an uh, artificial intelligence briefing with some industry leaders later this afternoon. Um, what, what could we do to help AI platforms and social media companies shield their data or tools from being used for more elaborate, you know, family emergency scams, things like that. You know, happy to work with you on that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm not sure how it, uh, what exactly could do on the social media side, but one one thing I will say is that the TCPA right now um, makes illegal uh, robocalls to cell phones. And robocalls are making calls with a pre-recorded or artificial voice. So I think there's just one thing there is the TCPA I do believe applies. Okay, great. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I yield.